Time to talk about likelihood of confusion, the standard of liability that governs infringement cases in trademark law. And it's worth noting at the outset that we are dealing with what is often a very tricky problem. And what is the tricky problem? Likelihood of confusion. That is a factually elusive question. It's also a definitionally elusive question. And trademark law does not require actual confusion. And we are not always clear on what we mean to be confused from either a quantitative or a qualitative, qualitative perspective. What exactly do you need to be confused about? What and how many people need to be confused? What is the depth of confusion that is required? And, all, and even if you resolve those questions of definition, we have this other issue of trying to figure out whether or not that level of confusion is in fact likely, given that we may not have actually confused consumers there to tell us, hey, I was confused. And what we have developed in trademark law are these multi-factor tests to kind of guide courts through the process and function as an evaluation device for whether or not this state of likelihood of confusion actually exists. And the example case we have is Virgin Enterprises. And in Virgin, we have these competing marks. We have the well-known Virgin and Virgin Megastore brand. They're the senior user. They have many, many businesses. Virgin Megastores at the time of this litigation, they sell electronic equipment, but they don't sell phones. Virgin Mobile sells wireless service, but not phones. And we, our junior user here is Virgin Wireless, and they, sh they sell wireless communications products. And as a side note, it's worth noting that you know, this is a traditional trademark infringement case. We are dealing with likelihood of confusion, but we could potentially see it as a question of marketplace priority. Who has priority over Virgin in the wireless market? And does the Virgin Megastore priority, priority in its markets carry over and extend into the markets for Virgin Wireless? But of course, in this case, we're styling that question as a straightforward question of trademark infringement liability and whether or not a likelihood of confusion exists. And the district court in this case denied a preliminary injunction on behalf of the plaintiff. They say the defendants were the first to use the mark in telecommunications. They were the first to attempt to register for telecommunications and retail phone sales. The marks are dissimilar when you consider their logos and the retail settings are different, small outlets versus mega stores. And the, the district court's ruling, of course, is rejected and the plaintiff prevails. So let's talk about the multi-factor test. And so the multi-factor test exists in all of the circuits in, in the United States, and it goes by different names in different courts. Usually it's known by the name of the case in which the court first recognized its particular incarnation of the multi-factor test. And so you have someone here about the lap factors in the third circuit, the pizzeria uno factors in the, I think the fourth circuit, the DuPont factors in the federal circuit, sleek craft factors in the ninth circuit, and the Polaroid factors in the second circuit where we are when we're talking about Virgin. And, and Polaroid is kind of the, the first case in the modern line of multi-factor tests, or it's the one that sort of we, courts point back to in an opinion by Judge Friendly, where he kind of pulled these factors together in the Second Circuit. And so we have the various factors in the Polaroid test, the strength of the plaintiff's marks, the similarity of the marks, the proximity of the goods. If the goods are not in the same market, what is the likelihood of bridging the gap? Any actual confusion, consumer sophistication, the good faith, of the defendant and the product and the quality of the products in question. And so let's start with mark strength. And so what is a strong mark? Well, a strong mark can be one of two things. It can be a mark that is inherently distinctive, in which case an awful lot of marks are strong in that sense. And, and that's, that's not a small observation. If a court is predisposed to thinking that the strength of a mark is a significant factor in favor of the plaintiff, because given how easy 
It is for a trademark holder to come up with an inherently distinctive mark, one that is arbitrary, fanciful, or suggestive. Then that suggests you know, the possibility that sometimes courts are going to very casually put a thumb on the scale on behalf of the plaintiff, at least if they're not thoughtful in how they administer this factor. So anyway, one way a mark can be strong is by being inherently distinctive. Sometimes courts will make, you know, will make something out of whether it's registered or not. Another way a mark can be strong is if it has strong acquired distinctiveness. That is, it's well known or possibly even famous. And so here, you know, there, there's not, not necessarily as many trademarks that find it so easy to be deemed strong, depending on how the court calibrates its sense of what is ha what does it mean to have strong acquired distinctiveness. Now, we have this other question of what is the point of having mark strength be a factor in adjudicating whether or not a likelihood of confusion exists. And so one possibility is this idea that by requiring or favoring marks that are strong, we are ensuring that certain trademark law goals are being met. That is, we're protecting words that distinguish and identify and not words that merely describe. In, in other words, a weak mark, like, some, like a descriptive mark. Query, though, whether that's something that should really intrude into the question of likelihood of confusion. Like, what, what does that have to do with the defendant's conduct? And maybe that's really kind of mixing in a question of eligibility with the adjudication of whether or not there's a likelihood of confusion. Another argument in favor of treating mark strength as relevant is this idea that it serves consumer expectations. And this is a point made by Judge Laval in the Virgin Opinion. And so this idea that when a mark strongly identifies and distinguishes a good or service, consumers, when they see that mark in another setting, are more likely to think that there's some connection with the mark that they're familiar with in another setting, right? So consider the difference between Zaza Q burgers versus Tasty Burgers. The latter is going to be the kind of mark that consumers are more likely to say like, oh yeah, lots of people are gonna call their hamburgers tasty and not necessarily attach so much importance if they see that mark in a different setting. In contrast, Zaza Q is going to be something you know so unusual, so fanciful, that if you, if you see Zaza Q in another setting, you're more likely to think like, oh, that must be, there must be some kind of connection with the brand that I'm familiar with in another, in another place. Now, we can tell a counter story about the mark strength factor, can't we? If a mark is famous, consumers are likely to know what it looks like. And if they know what it looks like, aren't they more likely to notice a difference between the famous mark and the defendant's mark if they are not in fact if they are not in fact identical and so i think you know another thing that may just really be going on with the mark strength factor is just sort of thinking that this is about free riding that if you find yourself using a mark that is really strong strong in the sense of being really well known you probably knew about it and you're probably trying to do something to kind of bask in its glow, to free ride off of its goodwill, maybe if not necessarily confuse people, go up to that sort of line. And so I, I wonder if that's not something that's going on in the psychology of the courts in developing this factor over the years. And maybe not necessarily thinking about so much as free riding, but maybe it's the kind of situation that a famous mark, a strong mark, a well-known mark is the kind of thing that looks like something that would be the mark of a trademark plaintiff. That is that if you, you know, I, I once surveyed one of my property classes and asked them to kind of imagine a hypothetical trademark case. And I, you know, I sort of, you know, it's my property class, right? So I'm not, they're, they're not learning trademark law at all, but I just sort of say the very, very, you know, basics of, of what trademark infringement is. And then I say, I said, imagine a trademark case. Now tell me who the parties are, or tell me who the plaintiff is. And, you know, some people came up with an imaginary mark, but most of them came up with a well-known mark that they were familiar with. And so it's like this sort of potential pattern recognition idea that when you think about trademark infringement, you think about a mark that is, is well-known. And if that's the one who you actually have as a plaintiff, then perhaps that's something that nudges the fact finder in the direction of finding infringement. So in any case, in the Virgin case, Virgin Megastores, the Virgin plaintiff mark, scores high on both types of distinctiveness.
Virgin is an arbitrary word as applied to electronic equipment. There wouldn't be an expectation that it's going to refer to electronics. And there's going to be a likely assumption that the same word for different stores signals some kind of relationship between them. And then from the perspective of acquired distinctiveness, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very well-known mark. Um, it's, you know, it's famous. Famous, of course, has a legal consequence in the context of dilution. So I'm not using it in its technical sense there, just famous as in fairly well-known. Now, what about the similarity of the marks here? the district court weighed this factor in favor of the defendant. Why? Because the defendant had a logo that used a different typeface and different colors, and the Court of Appeal says, uh-uh, that is error. And why is it error? That a different appearance cannot outweigh the identity of the terms, and consumers are often going to be identifying these marks in context that aren't going to have the kind of distinguishing context that the defendant put on it, right? The different kind of logo, different kind of colors. That's not going to work in word of mouth advertising. That's not going to work in advertising on the radio. And the marks are not going to be experienced by consumers side by side in the marketplace. And so interestingly here, the court says, you know, the, the district court got this so bad that this is a factor that favors the plaintiff as a matter of law. This isn't, you know, that, that you know, there was some sloppy fact finding. It, you know, the district court is just plain, just plain wrong here. Now, to think about how courts determine or evaluate mark similarity, they consider sight, sound, meaning. Any one of those three could be enough to support a finding of likelihood of confusion. It's important to note that you don't need to have a side-by-side -side comparison. You can find cases where marks that look very different, if you actually did look at them side-by-side, are still found to be similar. So a case, you know, um, involving Dramamine and Bonamine. And so courts, the, the, the court found similarity in part because these, these products were displayed to consumers singly and not together. And of course, the Dramamine and Bonamine example kind of raises the specter of dissection. And just as with determining what category a mark belongs to, courts are not supposed to engage in the dissection of marks when they're determining whether marks are similar or not. But of course, in practice, you know, the, the shared elements may lead a court to determine that there is some similarity, even if there are some distinguishing features as well. And so the um, you know, stated another way, the anti-dissection principle applies, but shared elements may, depending on the circumstances, be dis dispositive. A few years ago, Barton Beebe, a law professor at NYU, wrote an incredibly helpful empirical study of trademark decisions where he kind of looked through a, a large data set of trademark cases to determine what factors really matter in practice to the courts when they are assessing whether a likelihood of confusion exists. And he found that the similarity factor is indeed the most influential in trademark cases. And of course, I, I, I would think that that's not a particularly surprising result, given that, you know, if you're thinking about a likelihood of confusion, one is unlikely to confuse dissimilar marks. But as we'll see, the BB study had some um, much less intuitive findings that are also of, of, of great interest. So next factor to talk about, proximity and likelihood of bridging the gap. Now, why is this factor relevant? Well, the assumption about consumer psychology, and I think it makes a certain amount of intuitive sense, is that the closer the products are in, in, their, in their markets, the more likely the consumers will assume some kind of connection or a similar source. So take Kraft cheese grater versus Kraft computer. Which one is more likely to be affiliated with the maker of processed foods, and you know the, the question almost answers itself. And here we see also the prospect that wh what goes on in the adjudication of one factor may affect the adjudication of another. So the less similar the products, the greater the tolerated similarity between the marks. It's more it's more acceptable to have a craft computer. It, than, than it is to have a craft cheese grater. But of course, you're still acting at your peril if you duplicate the craft logo in its entirety. But while it might be unacceptable, uh, unacceptable to have just a typewritten you know, craft on the cheese grater, it would probably be okay in the context of the computer. Bridging the gap, right? Essentially, this is another way of giving the senior user rights to a market 
before they choose to enter it. And you see that at work in this case. The defendant is in the wireless market before the plaintiff is, but nonetheless, the plaintiff essentially has priority there. And that, that's the point I made before. It's, it's sort of shades of this idea of a zone of expansion, right? That you kind of see geo in geographic terms under traditional applications of the T. T Rose Doctrine. And so as applied in Virgin, the, the Court of Appeals says the district court wrongly relied on the lack of equivalent products. The markets are proximate here because phones are akin to electronic gadgets that the plaintiff is already selling, and the plaintiff indeed had plans to enter into the marketplace. Actual confusion. This is something courts say is particularly relevant, usually if there is some actual confusion. And so the, the, the presence of actual confusion hurts the defendant more than its absence helps it. Because courts will say, well, just because we don't have any actually confused consumers doesn't mean that there isn't still a likelihood. And so in this particular case, right, the court says, you know, it's, it's particularly relevant. It's not dispositive. This, of course, raises the question of what kinds of evidence courts take in the context of actual confusion and the prospect of surveys of consumers. So not having actual consumers in the marketplace, but consumers who are surveyed acting as evidence for potential confusion in the marketplace. We'll discuss surveys in a later lecture down the line. So as applied in Virgin, there was some evidence of customers asking if a connection exists between the products. Just a quick side note, and I'll cover this a little bit more in a later lecture. There are precedents there that will discount isolated or de minimis examples of actual confusion. And there's various ways courts can hand wave their way out of the presence of actually confused consumers. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a later lecture. Consumer sophistication, why does this matter? And so this, this notion here is that the more sophisticated consumers are, the less likely they are to be fooled. And so is that true? I mean, what, what else could, what, what's another story we could tell about you know, so-called non-sophisticated or perhaps inattentive consumers? Maybe the extent to which we have a lack of attentiveness means that consumers don't actually care about the distinctions in question here, or, or, or say it another way, that any potential confusion is not actually material to a purchasing decision. And it kind of raises an important doctrinal point about trademark law. Unlike false advertising law, materiality of confusion is not an element of the cause of action. The plaintiff does not have to show that the confusion in question actually diverted sales or was likely to divert sales. They just have to show a likelihood of confusion. And then, of course, we get these battles about confusion of what that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about some more down the line. But in the false advertising context, when there is a deceptive statement made by a party or a misleading statement made by a party, one of the elements of the cause of action is that the statement in question was actually material to potential consumers. And so back to the consumer sophistication question, right? So maybe, maybe the um, confusion question isn't material if the consumers aren't really attentive. Maybe the mark is just so weak it doesn't deserve protection. Uh, maybe we can criticize this for there, there being some kind of paternalism, right? This idea that unattentive consumers need some kind of special protection and solicitude that the you know, sophisticated consumers don't get. Or maybe the argument is that non-confused consumers maybe should get more protection of channels of information and they shouldn't lose out because of the you know confusion of inattentive consumers and then we could have a nice debate about you know maybe it's paternalism you know no matter what you do so that question aside one thing that should be fairly clear is that the consumer sophistication factor has a lot of room for judicial man manipulation and so McCarthy has a quote that says, you know, a cynic would say that the standard of care laid down varies with the result of the case. That is, when a court wants to find no infringement, it says the average buyer is cautious and careful and would never be confused. But if the judge thinks there is infringement, the judge sets the standard lower and says the average buyer is gullible and not so discerning and would be easily confused by the similar marks. And you know this is the kind of situation where you get these really odd litigation incentives. So the plaintiff basically wants to say to the court, you know, your honor, my clients are idiots, right? <laughs> you know, that, that, that my customers are gullible and careless, and they're not going to be able to pick up on the subtle differences between the defendant's mark and my own. Whereas the defendant's saying, you know, your honor, I mean, the plaintiff's customers, they, 
it's like a Mensa convention every time they get together to buy something because they, they really know their stuff. But, you know, just to think about the easy um, manipulability of this factor, you know, just, just imagine if you're, you know, you had a case involving bubblegum and, you know, the, 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 the consuming class here was predominantly children. And so the argument for lack of sophistication is, you know, my goodness, Your Honor, they're children. They should be protected from infringing marks. And isn't it awful that the defendant is having the similar mark knowing they're gullible and they don't know what it's like in the marketplace? And, you know, you can imagine the argument from the other side saying that, you know, children don't have a lot of disposable income. They're not able to buy a lot of things. And one of the things they are able to buy is something like bubble gum. And when you're blowing bubbles and you're, you're, you're doing that, at least when I was a kid, you know, you kind of had preferences about which gum works best for blowing bubbles. And that's the kind of thing that, you know, that, that kids could actually be really, really sophisticated about, notwithstanding the fact that they're kids and notwithstanding the fact that, you know, bubble gum is a relatively cheap product. Which of those two stories is true? I have the faintest idea. It's just not hard to spin them out. And so it's not hard for a court that is already inclined in one direction or the other to latch on to one, one of those stories. Another interesting tension that exists in the consumer sophistication story is that you know, for, for a mark to be protected, consumers have to be able to see it as being capable of identifying and distinguishing goods and services. But for a mark to be infringed by a non-identical competitor, consumers have to be unable to recognize and consider the differences between the plaintiff and the defendant marks, right? So again, this is this idea that maybe it wasn't as distinctive a mark as it could have been in the first place. So anyway, that, that's a potential, you know, tension in, 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 in the doctrine. In application in the Virgin case, the court says it's, it's, it's a neutral factor. Then we get to bad faith. And so bad faith is an interesting one. And so in this particular case, it's neutral. But what's interesting about bad faith is that it comes up and plays a role in a lot of trademark cases. And it really punches above, <laughs> above its weight in relevance in determining outcomes. So first of all, why would bad faith be relevant to whether or not there is a likelihood of confusion? And so, you know, maybe one way of looking at it is that, you know, if one intends to ha achieve a certain result, then one is likely to do so. So if one is setting out to confuse consumers, then one is, you know, likely to achieve that end. And therefore, one's intent is therefore relevant to the analysis. You know, maybe, right? But it's a bit of a bank shot. But it also assumes we know what we mean when we say bad faith. And here, courts can be pretty variable about that. Because yes, if you are selecting a similar mark in order to confuse consumers, sure, that sounds like bad faith. That sounds like the kind of intent that we should be concerned about in trademark law. But what if you're selecting a similar mark to inform consumers? What if, for example, you copy packaging of over-the-counter medicine because you want, with a color scheme, to communicate to consumers that your generic product has the same active ingredient as does the popular brand name? Is that bad faith? Are you actually trying to deceive consumers or are you trying to inform them? Are you trying to efficiently transmit information in a crowded marketplace in a way that consumers can easily make use of that information? And so if a court is careless about what constitutes bad faith, that's the kind of thing that may not be considered in the direct way that it should in weighing the merits of an infringement case. If a court thinks that it's a bad thing for the maker of generic acetaminophen to use a similar color scheme as the maker of Tylenol, then it should be explicit about what it thinks is wrong about doing that. But it's, it's, it's not necessarily the case that the selection of the color scheme with a distinct brand name was done to confuse consumers versus trying to inform consumers of the equivalence between the generic and Tylenol. And at the very least, there's a good argument that that kind of information transmission may benefit many consumers in the marketplace. So in any case, bad intent is not required, of course. Innocent infringers can be subject to suit, and you know, it may factor into the way the court deals with remedies. And so here's, I was alluding to this before, but um, Barton Beebe's study about the application of the factors in the various courts says that bad faith, bad faith determinations by the courts 
actually play an outsized role in the ultimate disposition of likelihood of confusion cases. It actually makes a big deal to the courts, despite its questionable relevance as an empirical matter. And then finally, we get you know, fa um, you know, one of the lesser used factors, quality of goods. You know, what's the relevance to confusion there? You know, maybe an obvious. You know, you 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 could imagine, for example, that obviously shoddy goods might you know undermine any potential confusion. Maybe it goes to you know the harm of any confusion if there actually is some. In the Virgin case, it it is it is neutral. In sum, in this particular case, the court says you know well we're not going to sum up the factors, but the result is clear. The owner of the Virgin Megastores mark is going to prevail. And note that the actual way the court you know they kind of lay the factors out, and then the actual sort of explanation about why one side wins is relatively light compared to all the analysis that has gone up to, to up to this point. That was a fairly long dive into just one case's consideration of the factors of the multi-factor test, and we will return to some of the issues raised by the multi-factor test in the next lecture. Thanks very much.